Welcome back to the Chess for Life Spotlight. I'm your host, Elliot Neff, National Master, founder of Chess for Life, and I am very excited today to bring to you our special guest, Dr. Joe Castleberry from Northwest University. And a little bit of background here. I'm only going to touch on a, a piece of this, and then I'm going to ask you to <laughs> dive into this, Dr. Castleberry, is you have really traveled the world. You have worked, lived in other countries, multiple languages. You've done so much. We've transitioned through the COVID scenario. There is so much to talk about, but I want to thank you for joining me today on the Chess for Life Spotlight. Oh, it's a pleasure, Elliot. Uh, I've appreciated your friendship for so many years, and we've got great, great memories together, so this will be another one. <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you for that. And just to let our audience get a little bit of a background, do you mind starting out by letting us know where all have you lived and give just a little <laughs> snapshot of that background and what led you to coming to become president of Northwest University? Well, I'll start with that last one. Uh, I, uh, at, at the age of 15, I visited, uh, actually 16, I visited Honduras and absolutely fell in love with Latin America. I had sensed a calling from God to be a missionary before that. And, uh, so I, that was my first experience of going overseas, and uh, I just fell in love with Central America and, and with the Spanish language. I, I uh, had super fast uh, success in learning Spanish. I, within 10 days, I was having meaningful conversations with people, and uh, basically within about 30 days had uh, gotten to the point where I could communicate quite fluidly. and. Uh, it, I just uh, loved it from the very first minute. And uh, so I kept going back to Latin America on trips every year. And um, when I got to college, I realized that I wanted to be a college professor. And uh, at, at age 21, I was in my dormitory uh, grieving one night. We had experienced a tragic event in our family. And mm. I was in deep grief, just wow. deep misery and, and praying and, and seeking God. And and in the midst of that grief, this bolt of light <laughs> shined in my head. And I sensed God saying to me, don't worry, I have a great future for you. Uh, you're going to be the president of a university. And I believed it. And so I started preparing for that uh, at age 21. Uh, I would go on to Ivy League universities for graduate programs and um, but I became a missionary and, and moved to El Salvador in the middle of the Civil War there in uh, 1990 and uh, lived wow. in Costa Rica for a year before that in 89. And um, so it was, that was, those were dramatic years. Uh, the Soviet Union was, had fallen in 89 and uh, El Salvador was in the middle of a Marx Civil War. And, uh, you know, there was tremendous openness to new ideas in the country during that time. And, uh, it was a, it was remarkable, really a remarkable time. Um, but uh, over the course of the years ahead, I would uh, live in El Salvador and, and Ecuador for years. And um, over the years since then, I've had the privilege of traveling and working in 42 countries around the world. I've had conversations in uh, multiple languages. I can read the Bible in about 12 of them, but uh, uh, but um, just. Lo have loved the life I've had. Now I spend most of my time traveling in the Far East. Uh, I was just in Singapore and Indonesia this month, uh, headed back to uh, South Korea and Indonesia and Singapore in October. We'll go to China later this year when COVID settles up. And uh, we, uh, we've built a, quite an international student body here at Northwest University, uh, about 160 international students in a student body of um, about 20, 400. So uh, we are continuing to grow with in, in our international reach. We'll go to India in December and uh, begin working harder in, in that country to build relationships and attract more students from India. And wow. uh, we, there's a great future ahead. We'd like <laughs> to be the most international university in the country. We'd have to get the 30% internet, international students to achieve that. But uh, nevertheless, that's our goal, and I think we can get there. I'm uh, just going to have to continue to invest time and effort in it and uh, 
vision always precedes reality. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's great. So we have covered a ton of ground there in just about two minutes. Uh, thank you for sharing that from living around the world to that aspect of from an early age, having a clear vision of where you were headed. And I kind of live my life like a chess match, Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely going to bring in the chess piece because you've supported chess at the university. You've been a, an avid chess supporter player and so on. And we're going to we're going to talk about that here on the Chess for Life Spotlight, of course. As we do it, I just find it fascinating, the fact that you had a vision at that early of an age. And let me just ask one follow-up question to that is you've mentioned living in Honduras, Ecuador, El Salvador. Uh, making choices that were sometimes maybe not the natural <laughs> human choice to go to a country in the middle of a civil war and move there in the middle of it, as opposed to stay away from it. <laughs> Did you see all those experiences as well, simply you, supporting your vision of becoming that college university professor? What, what I have to say, my life has been like a chess match, but I'm not the player. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I uh, I have had a sense since childhood of, of being in God's hand, and it seems like he's planning all the moves. I, I No one in my family had been to college. Uh, my mother and I were in college the same year when I first started. She went back to school late in life, uh, uh, but neither of them were college graduates when I was growing up, and, and uh, so we didn't know how colleges work. We certainly didn't. There was no reason, no rational reason to expect that I could become a university president. I didn't know how anything worked. You know, we were a working class family. I didn't understand how society worked at all. I, I had no strategic ability to plot a, a course from the paper mill where I worked on, in the summers to um, the president's office at a university. Uh, I had no idea. The only thing I knew was that I needed to get the best education I could. And so I I chose to go to the best schools that I could get into, and they were the best schools in the world for, for the areas I was studying, and um, that helped. Uh, but that, you know, going to school is never going to get you where you want to go by itself. It gives you opportunities that might open doors for you, but you still got to walk through, the, you, you got you to gotta make the right decisions all the way <laughs> along. And, um, so you know, I look back over the course of my life and... I never made a major ch change in direction without a really clear sense of God's leading, and, and I've never missed it. It's, it's been the right choice every time, um, and I can't take any credit for it. I mean, it's not like I was smart enough to figure out a strategy to get myself uh, to the places I've been, um, even, even into this, uh, you know, I went to Princeton Theological Seminary, which is not an Ivy League university, but uh, the best theological seminary in the world. Uh, uh, academically during my time, uh, still the most high, heavily endowed institution in the world per student. And um, it was a phenomenal education, but God did that. I, I, it wasn't my strategy. I applied two months past the deadline when all of this, uh, when all the decisions had been made for uh, admissions, um, all the financial aid had been awarded. Um, I applied two months late and uh, Somehow, miraculously, they opened up a new place. They leapfrogged me over 62 people and gave me full tuition scholarship. Uh, you know, it was just crazy. The same way with doing my doctorate at Columbia University, that, you know, I, uh, that was a completely unlikely story the way it all happened. But, uh, you know, God made a place for me and I worked hard. Um, and, you know, the working hard matters too. God, God helps those who help themselves, the, the old saying goes. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so, so in the chess analogy, was to try to be really sensitive to God's direction and do what he told me oh. to. <laughs> <laughs> so using that as a chess analogy, what you're saying is uh, God's playing the chess game and you're moving the way you were designed to move. <laughs> I'm just a piece. That's all a it piece is. He's <laughs> on the chessboard uh, following yeah. along. And, uh, what's interesting to me here too is hearing this progress and looking backwards, you're able to see the thread through all these circumstances leading to where you are now and, and moving forward. Just for the sake of our audience too, was your, uh, your tenure here at Northwest University, 
Did you have prior experience as a university president or was this your first? Oh, that's a good question. I, as a missionary, I was always involved in education as well as uh, uh, pastoring churches and, and doing all other kinds of things that you could imagine. But um, in Ecuador, I was dean of a small seminary that gave me some administrative experience, but it certainly wasn't anything compared to, you know, the United States. I think we had 150 students in the seminary, very small. Um, my first job in an American university or college was uh, I, I was chosen as academic dean at the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary. It's a national seminary with worldwide uh, constituency. Um, is, there's no reason I should have gotten that job except that I, um, I somehow was exactly what they were looking for. I had 20 years of experience. I, I had a first-rate doctorate. I had a good list of publications. I had a teaching experience. I had some administrative experience. I'd been an entrepreneur and, and starting all kinds of new things. Um, it, it had developed enough reputation that they took a chance on me. Uh, I, I, I really didn't have experience that was adequate, but they, um, they believed I might be able to do it. So they gave me this amazing job, which one step away from a presidency. And uh, it worked. So five years later, when a university presidency arose, um, I was selected by Northwest University. That was after dropping out of about five presidential searches where I just didn't feel God's favor in the search, didn't feel like it was the right institution. And I actually turned one college down uh, before I came here. It was a great job. It was <laughs> a great job, but uh, just didn't feel God's favor on it. And I uh, wound up here and it's been 15, and this is my 16th year at Northwest. It's been wow. an amazing experience. We've risen five Carnegie classifications during my 15 years. It's, that's unheard of. Um, wow. you know, it's, it's, we've doubled in enrollment. It, it's just been an amazing 15 years. And, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know how it, I don't know why it worked. You know, it's not like I have some special talent or something like that. That's not true at all. Um, I've been able to get a great team of people around me who really know the business, real professionals, and for some reason they're willing to work for me and work work for the Lord here. Um, but we've we've had an amazing run, and uh, you know I don't have any sell by date on it. I, I yeah. I'm 62. I'm going to work at least another 10 years. I'm asking the Lord maybe for another five. The the longest serving president in American history at a college, uh, Eliphalet. Not of Union College in New York served for 62 years, so I don't think I'm going to beat his record. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I kind of like to stay at this till I'm maybe 77. I've got 100 years of vision, and only maybe another 15 years to to, to realize my part of it. But um, you know, it's well, that's that, that is awesome, and I and I want to come back to that vision in the future here and hopefully later in this conversation. But for a moment, let's take a segue now into the connection to chess, because that's how we crossed paths. Well, I guess we crossed paths in the community for a period of time, and then through the game of chess, got to know each other better. And so do you mind sharing a little bit of when you first discovered chess, when you played the game, and then let's transition that conversation into what led to your supporting chess at Northwest University? Well, I first started playing chess at about the age of 10. My next door neighbor, uh, Mark Scoggin, uh, introduced me to the game. Uh, and uh, I started playing with Mark and my dad knew how to play. So I started playing with my dad and my brother, Randy. And, um, you know, that, that was pretty much the circle of chess for me <laughs> as a child. And, uh, and I certainly didn't develop any great skills, but I got to the point where I could beat my dad and my brother and uh, champion their, of that circle. <laughs> to my brother's total consternation. And no. uh, he, I didn't always beat him. But uh, anyway, it was uh, my play with my dad all through the rest of his life. And uh, so it was just it was basically a family game for us. We had no idea of the levels of chess that were being played uh, by, you know, we knew that high level chess was being played. I remember when Bobby Fischer was a big phenomenon and mm -hmm. I guess that was late sixties, early seventies. Well, it's right actually there. 50 year anniversary as we yeah. speak of yeah. Bobby Fischer defeating Boris Baskey. Yeah, that was the a Cold big War. national story. And uh, you know, we were mm -hmm. all, I think everybody in America was kind of interested in chess in those years. 
um, because it was, you know, it was part of the whole rivalry with Russia, right? <laughs> which was pretty hot in those exactly. years. But, um, you know, so I enjoyed it, uh, but it really didn't have any, um, boy, if I'd have had chess for life back in those days and could have played online like that and had instant access to, you know, computer chess or, or you know, chess.com where you can play other players, it would have been really good. But um, so I liked chess and played it all my life. But uh, uh, then I met this guy here in the area who was just a phenomenal networker. And uh, his name was Elliot Neff. And <laughs> <laughs> he, um, he reached out to me in the community. We became friends and, uh, you know, I became part of his network. And so Later, when um, Fiona Mutesi needed a place to go to college, uh, you reached out to me and uh, made it made it uh, known to me that she could possibly come to Northwest and would I be willing to give her a scholarship. And um, I, I had seen the movie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, of course, by the way, for those listening, it's the Queen of Katwe, Queen of Katwe, K-A-T-W-E, if you haven't seen it totally worth watching a Disney production, live action film, true life story told in film about how a young girl goes in the slums of Katwe, Uganda, goes to chess club for the food and eventually becomes a chess champion in her country, representing her country at the World Olympiad. A book was produced on this story and Disney picked up the rights to the book and produced a film. And so our paths had crossed a few times and we supported that project, Chess for Life did, uh, before there was a movie. And then once the movie came out and some things, yes, yeah, so I'll just jump right in there. <clears throat> yeah, there was, there was a need. And I recall making a few calls around and Northwest University came to mind and, and you, Dr. Castleberry. So I remember reaching out and that led to an introduction to say, I wonder if we could explore the possibilities for supporting this young lady to come to university. So if you can pick it up there, yeah. you know. Well, Northwest University is like a walking beauty pageant. I can't believe how beautiful our students are. It's, it's really, I don't know what it is that attracts them all here, but they're, they're beautiful. But we don't get too many Disney princesses, you know. <laughs> um, it's like, it like Ariel walking around or, you know, beauty, or, you know, Belle. <laughs> but um, yeah, so you came to my office with uh, Fiona and she brought her countryman, uh, Ben Macumbia, with her uh, to that meeting. He was here studying chess uh, for a few weeks. and mm -hmm. As well uh, as, of course, Robert Katende, the gentleman in the slum who literally was bringing the benefits of chess to these kids. So we met with Fiona and um, I felt led that uh, we could offer her a full tuition scholarship and uh, I think we wound up giving a little more than that to help. But uh, um, so while we were talking, I, uh, I asked Ben, because I never ignore somebody that's in the room, even if they're not a Disney princess. You know? <laughs> um, I asked Ben what his plans were for college, and he didn't have any because no one had offered him a scholarship. He didn't have any money. He was a slum kid like, like Fiona with really nothing, no no family back, no family support, no, no money of any kind, uh, just a great relationship with Robert, uh, which is worth a whole lot, but, uh, you know, he didn't really have any prospects for studying in America, but then I said, well, Ben, uh, I just, I just felt in that moment that I needed to offer him the same deal I'd offered her, so I offered him a full scholarship at Northwest as well, and um, they which both I, decided I, I just want to interrupt there a second and just say that was such an amazing circumstance, too, because Benjamin Macumbia was here visiting, pursuing his chess studies with us. We had offered him a, a scholarship in that front just to help him out and with no idea of the doors that were to open. And in fact, it was a last minute decision for him to even come to that meeting at the university versus continue his chess studies. Yeah. And so coming in there. And then, uh, as you mentioned, you're being led to offer him a scholarship, too. I would encourage anybody listening to check out the latest update on Benjamin Mukumbia as well. We just did an interview with him, and he has not only graduated from Northwest, he's halfway through a master's in global health at Duke University. <laughs> so you can hear the amazing updates on his story, too, if you check out the other posts that we've recently, interviews we've recently done. But back you know, to this, so, there we were. 
Fiona was famous and she was a highly rated player and very, very good and a, and a savage competitor. Brilliant player, but a savage competitor. And uh, But Ben outranked her by maybe 400 uh, ELO points. I mean, he was a superior player. And uh, he, when I realized we had two extremely fine players, that's when we decided to uh, start the Northwest University chess team. And uh, with Ben and, uh, and Fiona in first and second chairs, we were able to compete very successfully in the uh, Pan American uh, um, Team Chess Championships. And uh, that first year we won the small college um, championship and then we won it the second year uh, with those two in the in the seats and some of our uh, players here on campus rose up and um, improved their games remarkably it's amazing to me how fast a player can improve if they're getting the right kind of coaching and doing the right kind of reading and, and mm -hmm. um, study I mean you know you can really make huge progress in your chess and of course, I started playing myself more, playing more computer chess at that time, and, and improved quite a bit, uh, even to the point where I, I beat a couple of the couple of different players in speed chess on the team. So <laughs> <laughs> that's that would awesome. never happened in slow chess, I promise you. <laughs> so, so really, the the launch of a chess team at Northwest was simply you're going. Look, we've got students here who have talent and and skill and interest in this game. We want to support our student body in right. the interests that they have and and so on at the same time you know at chess for life we talk about life skills of success right the mindsets of success and the importance of having an attitude a can-do attitude right the importance of a of a fail fast a win draw or learn there's no losing in life even though there's painful experiences if we turn those into learning experiences and progress and being willing to embrace that uh what other you know, it's a funny have thing on, on that score. You know, people think of chess as a very rational uh, pursuit, <laughs> and and you really can't play with your emotions. You've got to think yeah. rationally, and you've got to plan and, and envision uh, several moves ahead and those kind of things. Yeah. But but the notion that chess is some sort of mechanical robotic thing uh, is just ridiculous. Uh, there yeah. there is such passion in the game and. You know, the emotions that surround it are really amazing. I, the, the experiences that totally. we had at those major championships were, were remarkable. They were remarkable yeah. emotional experiences. There's yeah. joy, there's disappointment, yeah. there's uh, excitement. It's just, uh, it's, it really does engage the whole person in important ways. And, and um, you know, it's that engagement with the whole person that, uh, makes chess a suitable learning environment for the whole of life. It, mm -hmm. It's not just a rational pursuit. It's a whole person pursuit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And just some of those principles that you were talking about even earlier, when you mentioned how college is not the end goal, right? It's, oh, right, it's right. The, the relationship to chess, right? The, uh, completing college is not checkmate. <laughs> this is like, the opening phase where you get your pieces out of the back row, get them in position, get your skills together in order to then go accomplish your mission in life. Yeah. And so, so or many analogies. This, it's just round one. Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> exactly. Well put. So with all of that support for these students, let's move back to a little bit of the vision of Northwest University. As you mentioned, you've been there 15 years, you're into 16 years. You've mentioned a hundred year vision, at least a quantity of things you'd like to accomplish. Can you share what you have done during the last few years, which were extremely disruptive in the world with the COVID shutdowns and all these pieces, paradigm shifts occurring globally in terms of technology and remote learning and all these things. What have you seen happen in the college space? And then more specifically, how has that impacted your vision for Northwest or has it impacted it? Well, I've always believed as an organizational leader, you have to be able to see five years into the future in order to survive. You saying you uh, saw COVID coming? Oh, <laughs> no, I didn't see COVID coming. However, I did see, I did see the changes that COVID, COVID sped up. I saw them coming more than 10 years ago. Um, yes. 
when I first came to Northwest, I could see that education was heading online and inexorably that it would go online. Yeah. Um, I could see Absolutely. that the classic liberal arts approach to colleges was dying fast. Yeah. Um, and that uh, colleges were going to have to be more uh, serious about uh, career preparation for students than they had mm -hmm. been. And so um, COVID has accelerated all of those things and more um, rapidly. And so there's, we're at a time of incredible ferment in, in, in higher education across the country. Um, in the next five to 10 years, a lot of institutions are going to fail, mm -hmm. um, especially small, small unendowed colleges. Uh, if they're not really forward looking, if they're not really serious about the business of higher education, mm -hmm. they're going to fail. Um, we're very serious about the business and we're not going to fail. But mm -hmm. uh, I can see a lot of our um, peer institutions are not going to make it because uh, they're not thinking far enough ahead. Let me clarify a question here. So as I hear you talking about this, one, yes, the technology, the impact of technology coming seems to be a key driver in this space. And it was something we at Chess for Life as well noticed, and we're on track to address. And then the COVID impact rather exponentially accelerated some of that technology and the embracing of it or the learning of these skills that people were reticent to learn. So that accelerated pieces. Would you say that there's an aspect of simply speeding up that is affecting the colleges. What I mean by that is oh, yeah. the rate at which jobs and careers are shifting due to technology and AI. And you mentioned that you've seen this, a shift in traditional college towards how are we adapting to meet the needs of this future? Can you? Well, I mean, there's just that? so many different aspects of it. I mean, one thing is that college doesn't take four years anymore. Uh, students mm. who are thinking like chess players are mm -hmm. getting a, a year or two of cr college credit before they ever walk through the right. door of college. Yes. Uh, here in Washington State, we have the Running Start program. Right. Students can finish their AA degree during high yep. school at a local community college. Uh, that yep. trims their college experience down to two years. So mm -hmm. um, one of the things colleges are doing, a smart colleges are doing to address that is that they're, um, they're creating uh, five-year master's degree program so that you can get your BA and MA in five years, or in this case, a case like that, maybe three years instead. So instead mm -hmm. of four years in undergraduate, you can come out with your uh, an undergraduate degree and an MBA or a, a, another uh, graduate degree in just three years instead of right. you know, two degrees in six years. Um, that, that cuts the time in half. Um, right. So, I mean, that, that's because of a lot of different things that are kind of hardwired into the system. When, you know, before 1830 or so, there weren't any high schools. There was no such thing as a high school, so nobody went. Um, people went to college during colonial days and around age 14. Uh, and so college was essentially high school. Uh, when the high school started coming along, they were serving primarily working class students. Uh, richer students went to college, uh, poorer students went to high schools. Through the 1800s, that increased. There was a huge struggle between the colleges and the high school about who was going to teach what, because um, there really wasn't much difference between college and mm -hmm. high school in those years. Uh, but as it turned out, the, the, the they made a deal that colleges would teach two years of liberal arts after high school. The colleges would teach the the high schools would teach liberal arts. Uh, college would follow up with a little more advanced liberal arts, but. Uh, but then go on to professional studies in the last couple of years or, or, or a liberal arts major. And um, so basically I, what I see happening is that the, um, the high school and the college are kind of merging again. Hmm. Uh, high school is the new college, college is the new high school. <laughs> hmm. uh, so that's just the reality. Colleges that don't see that and prepare for it are, are making a real mistake. Yeah. Um, so, and it's right and good that, I mean, it's become so expensive. I mean, people talk about the college as being corrupt. I run a very small college. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're typically about 800 undergraduates here. Mm -hmm. um, that's very small. And I, I know exactly what goes into our budget, um, you know, 
our faculty make national average salaries in a 130% cost of living environment. Just do the math on that. That's wow. scary. We're certainly not overpaying anybody. Uh, wow. We run as lean as we can, and it it still costs us, um, you know, what it costs to offer the education. And uh, I don't know how anybody could do it cheaper. Um, every college in the country pretty much loses money on undergraduates. The only way we, any of us make it is because of a government subsidy, a large mm-hmm. endowment, heavy fundraising, or uh, external sources of revenues like businesses or patent incomes, research, or you know other right. things that might bring money into the house. But colleges yeah. are, you know, it's not like we're just all full of fat. But nevertheless, the co- the cost has gone up and up and up and up and um, you know, we've got to, we've got to find ways to relieve that getting through faster is one really good way, but, but students have to prepare too. You need to, you need to approach college like a chess player. You need to think all the way through and, uh, and make, make preparations early for what you for the move you're going to spring later. <laughs> Absolutely. And what I hear you talking is just like a master level chess player, just applying it to your presidency that of the long-term thinking, the long-term vision, and yet navigating through changing circumstances, being willing to adjust where needed without losing sight of that long-term goal. One of the grave problems in America that I've noticed years ago, and now two years ago, started taking very concrete steps to address it, is the the collapse of the American work ethic. Uh, It's called Mm. the great nation in America. Some people are calling it the quiet quit. Yes. Uh, in China, they call it the Tan Ping movement, the laying flat movement, hmm. or, uh, lying flat movement. And, and it's basically it's hit all advanced economies of the world. Young people do not want to work anymore uh, as a whole. I mean, there's plenty who are have good, good work ethic and solid mm-hmm. values and all that. But a lot of kids just don't, don't want to work. They'd rather play video games yeah. or, or some other thing. Uh, um, they'd rather waste their time doing other stuff. It's not that those things aren't have not that they don't have value they do playing chess has huge value mm-hmm. but you can't spend all your time doing it right. um mm-hmm. so um the, the collapse of the american work ethic is precisely um due to the collapse of christian culture in america and western culture yep. uh, the, re- the wholesale rejection of western culture has a whole lot to do with this mm-hmm. um, it, it will be devastating to the future of the country if we don't turn it around so mm-hmm. um We've started a thing here at Northwest called Ready to Work, yeah. and uh, from from the first uh, from right at the beginning, we encourage students to start taking internships. We have incredible local companies around us. We've got the best corporate map of any college in the country, literally you, within yeah. a five mile radius of my camp. I've got Google one mile away, uh, Nintendo of America one mile away. There are thirty four game development companies in Kirkland and Bellevue, just within a five mile radius of my campus. We have unbelievable. Kirkland is the number one startup city in the country for wow. funding of startups. Um, it's we have you know Costco and Starbucks and Nordstrom and uh, Boeing and uh, Microsoft is just five miles away. A Facebook campus of ten thousand employers employees is being built uh, three miles from my campus. Uh, all the major tech companies have big hubs here. It's it's just a phenomenal environment. Uh, for doing internships in college. So we're, we're trying to get our students out into internships as early as possible. Um, you know, and we, we require every student here in their sophomore year to take a course on the theology of work. And we teach them a biblical work ethic. You've heard of the Protestant work ethic. It's not just Protestants. It's, it's anybody that, uh, that believes uh, uh, the Bible has wisdom in it not to be listened to. Uh, you know, and that's pretty, that's pretty, that's a, not a heavy lift there, you know, <laughs> that there's wisdom in this document that has survived for thousands of years and keeps getting read, you know, people keep reading it for a reason. There's a lot of, a lot of good. And, uh, you know, we, we teach people a, a biblical theology of work. What is the spiritual dignity of work? What is the meaning of work for human life? Um, we teach them the reason for having a strong work ethic. And uh, teach them work is worship. You know, work is not just something you do in order to you'll, to have money to live your life. It is, you know, at least a third of your life. Uh, more than that, if you're ambitious, 
And uh, it, we need to understand what it is and why to do it. But we, we really try to build a strong work ethic in our students and they make incredible employees and everybody in this area knows it. Yep. Um, so, well, and, and this is fascinating you know, on the subject of work and the quiet quitting, right? That has been going on in our society and how much of that I think about is due to a person being de-energized, non-motivated, not seeing value in what they're doing, or perhaps in a chess analogy, uh, being a person with certain unique capabilities, like the knight, which can jump over other pieces, yet being in a position where you need to move like a bishop. And so if it yeah. doesn't fit, how are you going to be energized in it? And so discovering those unique abilities and pursuing them and then putting in that effort to achieve, which in the chess world, again, we talk about, don't, you know, I heard this recently, not, not in chess, but I think it applies to chess as well as to any other piece. And there's only one rule to succeed in business. Don't quit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah keep going. Strategy, you know? work hard. Right, and, and exactly. Don't future. give up. Learn yeah. as you go. So you know, this, this is fascinating. While we're on the topic of how you're preparing youth and you're in what many would call the, the new Silicon Valley with all the tech companies and the investments and startups and all of this and how you've been uh, moving opportunity within the university to prepare youth for these things. Yeah. You mentioned it's a small college, so there's obviously limited space for enrollment. What kind of students does the university really attract who would be, let's say, the ideal candidate for, hey, this is a great choice to help you succeed in your future? Yeah. Well, first of all, we call it the Silicon Forest. And uh, as a Northwest native yourself, you know that we're just surrounded by the most beautiful forest on the planet. Yeah. Uh, the natural environment here is just spectacular. There's seawater, there's huge Lake Washington within view of my office here. I can look down the hill and see it. It's, it's beautiful, yeah. um, um, unbelievable nature in our state, unbelievable geographic yeah. and geological diversity. It's just, a, it's an amazing place to be. Just like uh, that annual race, the ski to sea in the Northwest, where you literally start by skiing and you end by yeah. swimming or kayaking. It's just an incredible and canoeing yeah. and biking and everything. So yeah, sorry for the segue there, but yes. Right. So all that with one of the greatest business climates in the, in the world here in Seattle. And, and again, a startup, a startup, environment second to none, literally to none. Uh, you'd have to go to Singapore or Israel to do better uh, and might not do better there. But uh, at any rate, we, you know, Northwest is focusing on four things for the future. We're focusing on business. We're focusing on technology, on healthcare, and on church ministry because Northwest is a Christian university. You ask what kind of students we're looking yeah. for. In our undergraduate program, we're looking for students who are committed Christians that wouldn't prosper here. You know, we have a Christian ethic here. We, we have a Christian moral code and expectations for our students. Our students, uh, even though marijuana is legal in the state of Washington, it's not legal here. <laughs> you know, we expect our students to live sober lives uh, and we expect them to live disciplined lives that, are, that, are, that bring glory and honor to God. So, um, you know, that that segments our market pretty solidly right there. Yeah. You know, we also are looking for students who are not willing to give up on America, not willing to give up on the Pacific Northwest, who believe in, in God's power to bring a, a great awakening to America. There's been a great awakening every 80 years in American history. We're due for another one pretty soon. I think you see the, the, the like I was talking about the wholesale rejection of Western culture in our, in our country that's proceeding apace. Um, we, if we don't have a, an awakening soon, we're going to lose the, the, the magic that made America uh, what it is. So, um, you know, we're looking for students who believe in, believe in God's power to, to, to help the country, who, who will um, prepare themselves for great futures, who are willing to work, uh, who are willing to study hard because, you know, we, we keep a strong academic standard here and students expect, we expect them to work. Uh, on their studies and uh, and also to have a lot of fun and have great friendships. We're looking for students who are willing to invest themselves in community and be friends with other students and really contribute to the people around them. Um, those are the kind of people that, that do well at Northwest. Uh, 
not everyone that comes here is an academic superstar. We're not, we're considered to be moderately selective by US News and World Report, but uh, that's only because we have a really high SAT average. We, we don't turn that many students away because we scare them away before they apply <laughs> by, you know, uh, by, by having a high standard of Christian faith here and by yeah. you know, making it really clear that we're serious about academics. So students that are just playing or not really interested don't, don't tend to come. We have a nice high graduation rate up in the 80 something percent. So yeah. um, it's, a ser it's a serious place that's a lot of fun too. Well, I really appreciate that, Dr. Castleberry, and we're running low on time. I just got a couple more questions we can fit in here, even though I would love to keep talking probably for hours on the on more questions that have opened up that we could learn from just from your own experience, too. However, with that, with time, let's let's bring this to a close here with a couple more things. And those listening, by the way, we'll post links so you can learn more about Northwest University, follow this work. Uh, follow those links along. And of course, remember to like and subscribe to the channel to not miss out on many more amazing stories of chess and communities and transformation around the world. I want to dig into one more piece here. So you're talking about this focus and this local small university serving this community. And at the same time, you have this global perspective. You've been, right, 42 countries speaking multiple languages. And you spoke early on about how the university is expanding in terms of its international reach. How does that tie together? What do you see as that part of the vision of Northwest University in terms of serving the global community? Well, I mean, I think it's really rooted in our Christian faith. I mean, Christian faith imagines humanity um, brought together at the end of all time from every nation, people, tongue, and tribe. Um, you know, it's, it is a global religion to start with. And so, um, you know, we, when we see people from every nation, people, tongue, and tribe, it looks like heaven to us. Um, hmm. the, the, the Christian ethic above all things is to try to reproduce the, the conditions of heaven on earth. And uh, we think uh, in the harmony among peoples is, uh, is a huge part of that heavenly reality that we want to be a part of. So the more ethnic diversity we have here at Northwest, the more uh, uh, international student body we have, the, the, the more we approximate the conditions of heaven. Uh, and the, the warmer community that we build, the better friendships, the, the greater pursuit of truth, all of that is, is just inherent in our uh, spiritual vision for life and for what we want to accomplish. I do want to mention to you, to you that we're really pushing forward in our computer science programs and our user experience design program, data science. We're, we'll be adding game development next year because like I said, game development is the local industry. We're the Nashville of the game development industry in America, the Hollywood of game development. Uh, those are really important things to us. And healthcare as well. We're adding new yep. programs in physician assistant and doctor physical therapy. And so students will be able to go all the way through to their terminal medical uh, degrees, except for doctor of medicine. And that's off. That's a, that's a more remote future, part of the hundred year plan. Yep. Uh, but uh, you know, those are things that we're focusing on. And, and all of this is about what our mission statement says. We, the people of Northwest University, carry the call of God by continually building a learning community dedicated to spiritual vitality, academic excellence, and empowered engagement with human need. And that, that, that final thing is the end point of all of our striving, all of our efforts. We want to be part of building a flourishing human race for the glory of God and for the enjoyment of humanity and for, for peace and goodness and, uh, you know, and for better lives. Uh, it, the, that's God put us here that we might be a flourishing human race. And uh, when we, uh, when we share the gospel and bring people into relationship with Jesus Christ, when we meet people's needs, whether it's through business or, uh, you know, healthcare or education or, uh, any of the other, you know, psychological counseling, whatever it is we're, we're, we're offering, we all see it as um, uh, an approach to meeting human need and creating human flourishing. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful mission and something gets us up excited awesome. every day to, to go do it some more. <laughs> well, that is awesome, Dr. Castleberry. One final question I just love to ask, and tailoring this a little bit, you mentioned how you received this vision of being a university president when you were 21. And from that point forward, 
everything was really supporting that outcome, right? And you're still living that out. Imagine yourself at 19 or 20, before you had that clarity, what advice would you give to young people today who may be in that situation? It's the oldest advice in human wisdom. It's what the Oracle at Delphi uh, wrote, um, know thyself. You know, Mm -hmm. if you know yourself, uh, first of all, if you know God, it's a huge, huge step forward. Uh, if you know what God's purpose, you know what God's calling is for your life, that's a huge, huge starting place. Second, know yourself. Know your strengths. Know your weaknesses. Um, capitalize on your strengths. Try to avoid, get help for your weaknesses. Um, you know, know yourself. And then the other thing is know some other people. Build a network of friends. Uh, no one is sufficient in themselves. Everyone has weaknesses. Everyone has cracks in their, in their character. Uh, we all need each other to, to fill in those holes and, and, to, and to live together in good society and make good teams. And, you know, the, you need people in order for you to succeed in your own life. You need a good team. A lot of people think of this in a, in a sort of an individualistic way. I'm going to pursue my future as an individual. Well, that's not how it works. You really need a team. And if, if you've got a solid family around you, it makes all the difference. You know, if your parents are on your team, aunts and uncles, grandparents, boy, it makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, but if you don't have a, a, if you don't have a healthy family, then it doesn't mean you can't be healthy. And, uh, you know, you walk with God, you learn, you know yourself and you build around you the community that you can, that you need to, to fulfill your, 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 um, your dreams. And when I went to my doctoral program, I didn't have enough money. It was Columbia University for crying out loud. I didn't have any money. I still had student debt from my undergrad experience and uh, I didn't have any money. And, you know, I built a team of supporters around me that uh, financed my whole education. I never, I didn't spend a dime of personal money because I didn't have any uh, to to do my doctorate at Columbia. Uh, Every penny of that came from donors that I built a team to help me get through. And, you know, they, they joined in on the story. I tried to add to their life as much as they were adding to mine. And, um, you know, it, it, you need a team. And, and maybe you're not going to fundraise your way through college like I did. But, uh, you know. <laughs> wow. Well, that is, that is powerful indeed. The, the, the importance of working with others. Better together, we say at Chess for Life. And building oh, absolutely. team. And, and respecting those unique strengths and differences you know, to use the biblical, uh, you know, analogy of it too, how a body works together. And just because it's a hand, a foot, a different part, you need them all to be successful together. You're never going to be a championship chess player without championship player friends. <laughs> Absolutely. A champion yeah. in chess, a champion in life. That's right. Piece. So Dr. Casper, what a joy connecting with you again today, catching up a little bit. Thank you for taking this time. And everybody listening, of course, please remember, Like and subscribe to hear more of these amazing stories of chess impacting communities. Thank you for your work.